Hey everyone, it's time for the next episode of Gig Bag Chats. So let me ask you a question. What does Who Framed Roger Rabbit, Saturday Morning Cartoons, and Hanna-Barbera all have in common? Our next guest will tell us. Professor Mark, thank you so much for joining me today on the podcast. I'm excited to learn more about you. We've worked together for, you know, on and off for a little while now. But uh, tell the audience uh, what you do, because you do a lot of different things. Yeah. Uh, well, somebody asked me a while back. Uh, on, In fact, I think I've got it on an archival, uh, my uh, my old website. There's like an archival website where the, the original interview was. And they said, well, you know, Professor Mark, you do so many things. How do you describe yourself? You know, animator or uh, script writer, puppet builder? You know, what do you go with? And I say usually cartoonist is the best description of what I do, because often an animator uh, ends up, as I found out, uh, you know, fairly early when I, you know, moved to Atlanta and, um, you know, originally from Alabama to try to, uh, you know, get into the animation industry. But uh, I found out very early that most uh, animators end up usually uh, animating scripts from other people. And I kind of like to write my own stuff. You know, I just, it's a little more fun, I think, first of all, you know, and, um, so, uh, yeah, just like cartoonists, because, you know, people like Charles Schultz and uh, Bill Watterson and so many others like that, they would both write their scripts and, um, you know, do, you know, do their own drawings. And, and that's just really what I like to do, because I think it's so much fun. And uh, I, I was watching an interview, you know, obviously an archival interview with um, Jerry Jewell, who was the uh, head writer for The Muppet Show. And he said it was just such a wonderful thing to do because... Uh, he said, just any of the, the craziest fantasy you can come up with. And there's a team of people standing by waiting to do that. And, and that's what I love about, I, I think, animation and puppetry, and even to a, a lesser degree, radio uh, has all of that in common, is that one person can fulfill so many different um, jobs, if that's what you're into. And I'm kind of a, a you know jack of all trades or professor mark of all trades. And and that's it's just what I enjoy doing, you know, everything from, from voices and, and, and everything. Although, you know, when wonderfully, occasionally I'll get a decent budget, a halfway decent budget where I can get um, some help of like former students, you know, that do some voices. Like I've got uh, Jen Lee, so, uh, incredibly talented uh, voice performer. As, as you know, she did uh, the the voice of the uh, – Oh, okay. Yeah, You're it have was the Owen what, Security what was... superhero. She was the the, right. the wife or mother or something like that. We'll have to. We'll have to yeah, play I don't it. think she was yeah. a mother. She looked like a Mister. You know, Mister. Mister V. Yes, you know, yes, that was her. Yes. her <laughs> son. She was the sidekick of right, Mister V. Right. Stand back, Mister V. I'm gonna smash that door in. Yeah, and she just did a spectacular mm-hmm. uh, voice for that. And I've got uh, a. Just for about a year now, I've been working with another another former student, and, um, and I think he's he's probably pretty close to my age, uh, actually. I, I usually, you know, refer to to people in that category as returning students because occasionally I have student. You know, it's funny they're students, but they're you know pretty much my age. But just good grief, and t- incredibly talented guy named uh, John Bonnet who does he's doing a lot of my backgrounds now, and I think mm-hmm. you've seen some of his work as well. So, yeah, whenever I can afford to, I love to use uh, former students uh, to, you know, to help me out on these projects to, you know, to, to sort of speed things along. I mean, it's it's fun, uh, you know, in animation to to do all of these things. But, it, you know, it's time consuming. Absolutely. Yeah. Just uh, I totally understand that. Yeah. It just takes a lot to put it all together that, you know, behind the scenes that a lot of people don't realize, especially when it comes to cartooning and animation, I'm sure. Because you have to hand draw all this stuff and, you know, assemble all the elements rather than I just get a camera and, you know, point it at someone. Well, that's the nice thing about where puppetry comes in, because, you know, as, as I said, I, I dabble in a lot of these these different things, animation and, and, and puppetry. The cool thing about puppetry is that it's, it's very much like um, animation, but in real time. Yeah. Uh, sort of the advantage between animation and puppetry is obviously cost because because of the time mm-hmm. issue. Uh, but what's kind of cool is that I mean it takes it might take me a little bit longer to build one puppet. I, I might you know if I was to spend from you know eight a.m. to five p.m. every day for probably about three days, I could build probably one puppet. 
and then it's infinitely recyclable. You know, then I can do everything in real time. And, and that's what's what's so wonderful about it. But the, the great thing about, you know, animation, puppetry, stop motion, and like I said, you know, earlier to a lesser degree, radio is uh, a big factor I don't hear a lot of people talking about. And it was something that I, I learned fairly early on because originally I was, a, I was a theater major before okay. I saw Roger Rabbit. Uh, you know, that fateful year of 1988. And um, I decided I wanted to, you know, to go into animation. But uh, one of the, the things that I did learn that was very useful because an animator is technically, a, we're referred to as a, uh, as an actor with a pencil and a theatrical term. I'm very much, uh, you know, try to share with my students, the suspension of disbelief. Right. And that's one of the great things about, again, animation, puppetry, stop motion and so on is that it's, it's a little bit easier for an audience to accept these crazy scenarios that we're asking them to temporarily believe right. in. And that's, that's why I enjoy, you know, the, it's that fantasy aspect of, of you know, in, in science fiction, you just, you can do so much in these uh, realms that you can't get away with in, in traditional live action until fairly recently, right. you know, thanks to the technology with, you know, Jurassic Park and, and um, uh, you know, Lord of the Rings and, and those sort of epic, tales that they can do but you know back in the 70s when i was a kid um you know if if they wanted to do something on the the scale of tolkien obviously they had to do you know ralph bakshi did his version with rotoscoping how else are you going to do all those you know thousands of guys on horseback in animation that's that's the only way you can do it in 1977 or 1978 well it's interesting you touched on it like the the epics of of Heck, the Marvel movies or Lord of the Rings. I mean, we're starting to blur that line a little bit on live action and animation, you know, because when you see these behind the scene shots of any of the Marvel or the Rings movies, it's all green screen, you know. So yeah. at what point do we yeah. – it'd be interesting to see where that converges and if the, you know, the Oscar of best animation will start to migrate a little bit. I doubt it, but you yeah. never know. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, I think it was very important when, uh, you know, the first – I'd say really two of the big people that really um, sort of segued from the, you know, what I'll refer to as like the analog uh, age of animation to the the digital age, so to speak, um, was uh, two of the, I'd say probably two of the biggest guys were, you know, Richard Williams for, for Roger Rabbit and then um, uh, Dennis Murin uh, at an industrial light and magic. And, and both of them deservedly, uh, got Oscars for their uh, participation in both of those because, you know, as often told my, 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 um, my animation students at, at Art Institute and so on, uh, I'll say, you know, you really have to look at a movie like Roger Rabbit because it paved the way, even if you're not that much into Saturday morning style animation, which may not be a good term for Roger, but even if you're not that much into hand-drawn character animation, Roger paved the way for how all of these other movies are, are made, you know, Jurassic Park and, uh, and so on. There was a guy, I'm, I'm, I hope I don't have his name wrong. I think it was Michael Lantieri or, or, or something along those lines. And his, as I understand it, I believe he had the same job on Roger Rabbit that he did on Jurassic Park. Oh, interesting. Where if, if a character, you know, if, like, you know, if, and Roger were, you know, if, if you see Roger sitting in the, the chair, you're going to have somebody or a device that turns the chair around at the right moment. And they'll add in Roger later. Or, or if, you know, if he steps in a, in a puddle, in a rain puddle, then th- something has got to make a splash because it's that real world, uh, it's those real world elements that really tie in and make the, uh, the, the graphics or whatever that are being added later that make them more believable. The more you can have happening in the real world, the more convincing it is for the audience and, and the less work it is for the animators, <laughs> <Absolutely>. <laughs> you know. Yeah. So because you've got re- anytime you've got like real light hitting a real object, it's it's so much easier. Uh, oh, sure. Absolutely. Um, I know you touched on this a little bit, but how did you get started? So you were a theater major or in the theater world. Yeah. Yeah. We I have written, right. I, I it's it's kind of weird. And, and I, I talk about this briefly in my book, <laughs> uh, The Struggling Cartoonist, which is it's. The first, it's, it's like the first chapter of the pre, the, uh, the, the sort of the prologue is almost what really mm-hmm. happened. And then after that, of course, you know, when I, when I supposedly meet my cartoon characters, it, then it just, you know, rockets into the realm of fantasy really quickly where the, the characters start bursting out of my sketchbook oh, and awesome. so on. But, 
Yeah, but the first the first part of the book, you know, to get back to your question, is is more or less how it really happened. Uh, I had done puppets when I was uh, I saw the you know I'd seen the Sesame Street and, and the Muppet Show and so on, but when I saw the Muppet movie and I for some reason seeing those puppets in the real world, you know, just really kind of opened my eyes to the possibilities, and I got gung ho about about puppets for a while, and, and I was I think I was about nine or ten years old, and we were we were living in Birmingham because my mom was a newly single parent, uh, going back to school. And, uh, so we'd moved to Birmingham for the summer so she could, uh, I think she was going to UAB mm-hmm. maybe. And, um, I asked her, they, she'd been really good about buying me, whichever the puppets that were commercially available, you know, Fozzie and Kermit, right. and Miss Piggy and Animal, my favorite. But, um, she, uh, I, they didn't have Gonzo and I wanted a Gonzo, even though Animal's my favorite, I still wanted a Gonzo and I asked her if she would make me a Gonzo. And she's like, uh, I'm in school. <laughs> she said, I will show you. And it was so much better that she did this. She didn't say no. She said, I will show you how to use the sewing machine. Oh, cool. I will show you how to sew. So, you know, again, it goes back to that thing of, you know, give your kid a fish and they eat one meal, give them a fishing pole, they eat for life. And, and I really believe that's, I, I sort of approach the same thing with my mm-hmm. students. So, um, you know, that got me into building puppets. Uh, so I did puppets for quite a few years. Again, it was great because, you know, you could come up with all these, you know, crazy characters and situations that I love so much. Uh, and then in, when I, I got into Monsters sometime during high school and we did a couple of uh, I don't know how we got away with doing this horror comedy. Actually, two, no less. We did two horror comedies <laughs> in my high school. I don't know how they let me get away with it. I'm just I'm so grateful they did. I ended up talking to the principal years later. I said, thank you so much for letting me do that. She's like, well, she's really sweet. But um so uh, we did that, and I was interested in, and because of the play had done so well, about as well as it can do, to, you know, to small, um, you know, small town uh, like I grew up in Alabama, mm-hmm. and because the play did so well, I wanted to be a writer. I, I was already already writing like fantasy and adventure stories, and again, that's sort of you know t- I touch on that in the book. But so uh, so I'd enrolled at Montevallo, which is a has a fantastic theater department in. Um, in Alabama, just a marvelous people there. And uh, so I'd already en- enrolled in that. And so I was going to start in the fall as a theater major. And uh, some friends and I on our, our, you know, it's going to be our last time together. So we go to the movie mm-hmm. theater. And what do they got playing? It's like uh, Demi Moore and the Seventh Sign. Okay, nothing against Demi Moore. But it was, you know, kind of a not terrific movie. However... <laughs> However, and the previews, they showed the opening cartoon from Roger Rabbit as a preview. Oh, okay, yeah. And so, so yeah, there's, there's where all this meandering story gets back to your question. How did you get into this animation stuff? You know, well, that's, you know, it's about as brief as, as I can tell it. So there is Roger Rabbit, which I'm like, man, this is pretty cool. I haven't seen, you know, the animation just moves so smoothly. Yeah. It's not like that Saturday morning stuff I was used to in the, in the 70s. Uh, it looked more like the traditional Disney features from the, you know, their heyday, which is exactly what the movie was was supposed to be. Mm-hmm. And I remember thinking, and I can't remember if it was when Roger stepped out of the refrigerator and, you know, all of a sudden they're in a raw, right. real world. I was just like, <laughs> you know, but it, it was somewhere in that, somewhere during that preview, I, just, I remember thinking exactly because I quoted this time and again, you know, animation, that's what I want to do for a living. So, you know, that's where I am. And I, and I was fortunately, uh, uh, after that, a series of events, I won't, you know, go into the, all the details, but uh, I was actually able to take uh, an animation class from Richard Williams, who was the animation director on Roger Rabbit. Thank goodness he was, he was just so generous in sharing the information from the classic guys. I mean, what he did was go around and uh, before they, and you know, trying to, in some cases, he actually lured some of them out of retirement to, to work as his, at his studio, like guys like uh, Art Babbitt that had worked for Disney and uh, Ken Harris that had done the Coyote for Looney Tunes. And um, what was the guy? Uh, Grim Natwick, the, the guy that uh, I think invented Betty Boop uh, oh, cool. for Max Fleischer. And he also worked on the, uh, the Princess and Snow White. Oh, wow. And so he was, Richard Williams was going around to all these guys before they died, thank goodness, and 
luring them out of retirement in some cases to come work for him. And thank goodness he put everything in that book. For uh, Eventually, he put it in the book. The first thing he did was teach the classes live. Mm -hmm. And thank goodness I was able to, to take the one in, when he was teaching that in San Francisco. And it just, you know, just blows your mind. And he, he starts off the simple stuff and works his way up into the, you know, what most people think are the sophisticated bits. Uh, but, you know, I was just so fortunate that I was able to, to learn from guys like him. And then, you know, so he did first he did the live classes. Then he did the um, uh, the book, which pretty much became a, a, a textbook for so many colleges across the country. And then also, thankfully, he did the uh, the DVD series. He recorded the one. I think it was from Blue Sky in New York uh, and, you know, made that available on DVD. And now the app, that's the real because, I mean, the DVD set is like a thousand or twelve hundred dollars and, you know, not everybody can afford that. You know, thankfully, I had access to it because, you know, we had it at the library at Art Institute. So I show that to my students and I'm I'm sitting there taking notes, you know, uh, even though I've, I've took, you know, I was there for the live class. It's it's a great refresher. And they, they've, they've got the app now, which is like thirty five bucks. I tell my students like, look, if you could either pay thirty five dollars for the print copy of the book or pay thirty five dollars for the app which has a PDF of the book and it's got the animated samples that you can scrub through so frame by frame. You can see, you know, well, how did he do that? You know, how did he get that perspective in that shot? That's fantastic. And, and you can see, you know, you can watch it and see frame by frame exactly how he does it, which, Oh, it is, it is. I mean, even, even, I mean, go on you know, Blu-ray and DVD, but I even go back all the way when, when VHS uh, was thankfully available when I was, you know, first getting interested in animation. I mean, Really, it was like 1986 is where I remember we had our first VCR. But uh, when Roger came out, that's when I started studying animation frame by frame. You know, like watching the old Tex Avery cartoons, which were fantastic, and 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 the you know the Disney classics, and you know just frame by frame. Just I mean, if you got that's one of the best ways to study classic animation is just if you got a, a forward advance frame controller on your you know, your, your player yeah, of choice. Yeah. No, it's, I, I've always loved animation and Roger Rabbit in particular. Uh, I just remember watching that as a kid and just going, just loving it. And the fact that they were able to bring in not just characters from one studio, you know, because bringing yes. in Looney Tunes and Disney into one film is unheard of. Yeah. And Max right. Fleischer. And the Fleischer. With, yeah. With all Betty of those. Booth. Yeah. And, and I think if you don't blink, Coco the Clown might be in there somewhere. It's hard to, hard to so say. So I know that for the production that, that you and I worked on for the for the Owen Security, I equate that to a sort of a Hanna-Barbera style. Do you have a particular – Are you what kind of style of art influenced you to, to do what you do? Do you have a range of them? Do you like a particular style? Yeah, it's sort of a, a mishmash. I mean, I you know, people tell me I have a style and I'm like, it, and, and that's one of the things that I've read in art schools. That's one of the things that we should discourage students right away. You know, don't, whatever you do, don't try to come up with right. a style, you know, because, <laughs> because what's going to happen is it's going to happen naturally. Uh, and you're absolutely right. I've, I've got a lot of influences. I mean, of course, you know, Richard Williams and Rod Rabbit, he just did these spectacular, um, commercials of all things it's like what he would do uh which i thought was rather brilliant is he would you he would do his commercial business during the day uh and the money that he would make on tv commercials he would use on his he would you know do his personal projects at night like thief and the cobbler which is good grief if you ever get a, I mean you know it's on youtube now it's easy to find it it's just i mean everybody goes on about roger which was absolutely terrific but you know thief and the cobbler just will blow you away any any animation that you've ever seen it's just so smooth because you know in, in animation tex avery's is you know that zipping around that's that's fairly easy to do but it's like when if i want to do something like just pick up this bottle and turn it around like that that's the hard stuff you know when, when things start moving slowly and, and subtly that's the difficult stuff to do in animation so yeah it's the, the, the sort of thing that I do because, you know, the, the, the time and, and budget constraints that you run into as a commercial artist, um, you know, we end up doing sort of the Hanna-Barbera approach. And some, some people belittle Hanna-Barbera. Even I used to, I have to admit, because I, <laughs> I used to refer to them as the two anesthesiologists responsible for the comatose state of animation <laughs> during the 1970s. <laughs> Which was cruel. <laughs> that was wrong. That was I wrong. Regret that, you know, that, was, that was wrong for me to say that. 
when in fact, you know, looking looking back on it, you know, once once I got a better overview of animation history of the industry, and because I mean the really as early as the 1950s, the animation studios shorts started to shut down uh, because television, you know, the the and and so uh, in retrospect, what I, what I now say is they were in fact the two. Um, those those two were the two doctors that kept animation on life support uh, during the the seventies until the you know Roger Rabbit and I always say Roger Rabbit was the one that really boom that was that that really kicked off the animation renaissance. It had some moments before that when it was really you know in, in the ni- in the mid nineteen eighties it was really trying to rev back up you know to get life again. The Great Mouse Detective I think was a really good one because you know. Not only because the, the character animation, the story, and, and Disney was really getting back into, you know, making you care about the characters, actually. Uh, but also that it was kind of interesting how that was really the first extensive use they've made of a computer shot, a computer generated shot, a 3D computer generated shot, obviously, with that Big Ben sequence, which was, you know, for the time, that's that's still impressive to me. Um, but it, but they were so that, you know, Roger in 1988 really kicked off, I think, what we've referred to as the animation renaissance of the 1990s. And then, of course, you know, Little Mermaid right after that. And just, I mean, for a while, it was like Disney could do no wrong, you know, with, with Aladdin and Beauty and the Beast and Lion King. I mean, they were just, for the first time, they were handing out these massive checks back to the, I mean, these bonus checks to the animators who really deserve you know, the, uh, the success that really, they really should deserve. I mean, between the Lion King and and Aladdin, I mean, those are some, just in, in my mind, my childhood or growing up, I mean, those are just some of the most key moments of, of animation, you know? Oh yeah. They're spectacular. Of course now when the new live action, which are still technically kind of animation comes back out, it hurts my soul a little bit. Yeah. You see the look on my face. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, That one. (laughs) Just from seeing, just from seeing the beauty of, of the creation. I I distinctly remember sitting in the theater, watching the opening scene of Lion King, you know, when all the animals are coming. I mean, just the sunrise in the very beginning is is, first minute or two minutes whatever it is that whole yeah. sequence it was kind of like roger you just take that yeah. that first two minutes and i mean you are captivated you can't wait to say oh my gosh what happens next oh my god it's crazy it's just absolutely captivating yeah. yeah i love those you know i've always loved animation so it's always fun whenever we can squeeze animation into our work you know it's always enjoyable um yeah are you listening clients? I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> so speaking Animation. Speaking cool. of, of, of clients and animation, what do you, if a business? What do you think? Uh, uh, why do you think animation would help help a business sort of stand out from its competition, rather than doing a live action? Well, because so few people want to do it. One of the things uh, that fortunately keeps us in business is like you, it's it's so rare uh, that you have a commercial that you can um, recycle indefinitely because. Part of what gets what part of what gets a a uh, a cust or potential customer, let's call them, or a viewer, what gets their attention is the novelty of something, something new. So you've always got to keep it fresh. You've got to do something different that not everybody else is doing. Uh, before I moved over here, I was making a decent living, about as as decent as I could uh, in Montgomery, and that's part of the reason I moved is because I realized, you know, this is as far as I can go in this town, right. really. Which you know, it's a, it's a beautiful town. There's some wonderful people there and everything, but I was making what I referred to once again, and I mentioned this in the book, as these uh, boring, recyclable. I mean, just uh, live action commercials. It's just right. you know, nothing against me, nothing against the people writing the scripts or anything. It's just they'll put you to mm-hmm. sleep. You know, come on down and see the fine folks at you know at Blank's House of Blank. We got the finest blank you'll ever blank. Been in business you know, for blank years. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, Blank and his wonderful family. <laughs> and that's that was one of the things that really made me sick. And, th- and you know, I, I couldn't remember the name of the people if I tried. And, you know, so I was creative services director. And I say creative services director. Yeehaw. I was a one-man department, <laughs> you know, director. Right. Whoopee. But, um it was, I, I do remember that one incident where it was a, it was a car commercial. It was a car dealership. 
And they were like, you know, they just absolutely insisted on having their darling little children in the last shot of the thing. Because everybody loves kids. <laughs> I was like, sure, sure. Right. Let's go right. with that. <laughs> the client's always right. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, that is one of the part of, you know, that is one of the things about commercial art is, you know, you do, you do. But, um, you know, in contrast to that, that's the wonderful thing about animation is you can do anything you want. You know, any any crazy concept that you can come up with, uh, you know, in, in the traditional days of animation, let's say, for instance, you know, even hand drawn. Let's say, and I remember reading this somewhere in, in some book or another about, you know, it's, oh, it's easy to be a writer for animation because you can write anything you want. But then somebody else is, you know, here, I don't know how you're going to do this, but here. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> But, um, but, you know, say you write a line like, you know, and then you have uh, uh, a thousand uh, Arabian warriors coming down uh, on horseback, waving their scimitars, uh, you know, as, as they come over the, the sands of the Sahara or, you know, whatever crazy thing you write. Like, sure, that's easy to write that. But then, you know, you got to write, you know, you got to figure out a way to do that. Well, for instance, right now. Um, on that same thing, like how do you get a bunch of duplicate characters in the computer? It's the easiest thing in the world to do. Uh, even Peter Jackson was doing that left and right with, you know, he just re records like 10 or 15 guys in armor and then just tr 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 duplicates them. So, you know, I, I could do that. I would just have to animate one guy on horseback with his scimitar or whatever you like. Um, and, and right now I'm, I'm working on a, 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 an animated sequence for the uh, Cartoonville Fun House show, which I think I mentioned. And so we got this this one completely animated sequence within the show, which is based on this character named uh, Gibby the Gibberang that I've been working on with a you know with a client. And so we wanted to do a two minute fully animated thing. We did like a sixty second uh, PSA for social distance safety with the characters last year, which was great because it got me back, got us both you know back into gear with the characters. So this we're doing just like a two minute fully animated cartoon short. And there's one sequence where a rock gets thrown up against the beehive and all these bees start coming out. Well, you know, if I had to animate them by hand, that would be a task indeed. But I've really just got to animate two bees. Right. I got to animate the queen and then I've got to animate a worker bee coming right. out. And then, of course, I can duplicate that like crazy in the computer. I can do in, in Adobe Animate, which I use, you know, there's, you know, motion paths. So I can just draw a line and then have the you know, it's it's going through its little mm. loop and, and follows that line. And then all his little friends do the same. Gotcha. So that's, you know, that's just a, a really brief thing of, of how, you know, animation can come in handy like that. Uh, and, you know, the rate, for instance, you know, the raid commercials, mm. which not a lot of people know, uh, Tex Avery that we mentioned already. He did those. He did really? those first. I did not know that. Those, those cartoon roaches for raid. That was Tex Avery. Yeah, he actually did some work in advertising when he, he got kind of burned out uh, on the, you know, the studio scene and, you know, the studios were kind of going out of business mm -hmm. anyway. Uh, I think he, he did maybe one or two cartoons for Walter Lance that did Woody Woodpecker. And then he went into advertising, which I thought those, you know, those raid commercials are just brilliant. Yeah. But that's a really good example of, you know, of, of what you can do with animation uh, in a commercial that you couldn't do in live action. You know, you, you're going to train those roaches. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it never work with animals, especially roaches. Yeah, animals and kids. And in animation, they both behave like little angels, you know, or, or, what, or whatever you want them to behave. So I'm going to assume that you started your career doing hand-drawn animation. And now, obviously, probably much easier, like you were talking about, to do computer animated uh, characters. Do you do you have a – am I wrong or do you, do you have a preference on which one you like better? I, when I did you're, – you're right. Uh, when I did, I started off animating on paper. Uh, and when I first started out – let me see if I get a, one of the pencils right here. Uh, what I learned really quickly was these uh, blue – see, I've, I've, all the way along, all along the line, I've been – I try to search for, you know, shortcuts if it works. And because I, I was sort of dabbling in um, – comics, drawing comics in the early 90s. I worked very briefly for a, a, a short-lived cartoon uh, comic book studio in Montgomery. Wasn't my fault. Uh, <laughs> but um, they would use the blue pencils and then they would ink on top of the blue pencils and then scan them in and, you know, color in Photoshop or whatever, even, you know, that far back. But what I learned very quickly was you use the blue pencil 
So instead of, of having to like either photocopy or scan or, or clean up, I would, I would draw with the blue pencils and uh, color race, which were spectacular. And then uh, I would ink directly on them and I don't even have to use the eraser really. Um, and just scan them in and, and I would digitally paint them. But, you know, now with Adobe Animate, uh, ever since the drawing tablets, you know, I've, I've got a fairly small um, drawing tablet that I you don't have to have a big one. And, and for a while, I even used my little travel one when the, the big one that I had uh, broke, died, whatever. But, yeah, the you know, now I've there was a guy, uh, Jerry Fuchs, another great guy, was really nice to me that worked for uh, Stone Mountain Productions. And we started communicating before I moved over here. And uh, he said, you just watch. He said, you just wait and see. Once you learn how to use Flash, you right. know, which is now a right. Animate, he said, once you start to use Flash, you're going to be doing paperless animation before you know it. And I said, like, ah, you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> and um, he was right. So I thought, I thought what I would probably do is do my, I would, I would do my key drawings, which are, you know, like the poses, um, traditionally. And then I would do all my in-betweening in flash, but sure enough, he was right. Because once I got comfortable with it, uh, essentially what I'll do is I'll do, and here's just a really quick sample of the, you know, the sort of storyboards, you know, which is how it all starts off. There's a sneak preview of my next preview for the book. But what I started doing is I'll scan in my storyboards and I'll work on top of those. I'll clean those up. And those are usually my keys because a, a key drawing is a storytelling drawing. And then, you know, of course you got the breakdowns and the in-betweens and so on that everybody's already always talking about. But with one of the main difference between say the, what most people think of the Disney quality animation is, is full animation because it's very seldom that you only move part of a character. Like if I was going to animate this scene right here, I'd really only need to animate, you know, my mouth, which would be on a separate layer and my hand. And I might not even animate this bit here, you know, so that would be limited animation, but, you know, full animation is all of this, you know, when you have to redraw every single bit when the character's moving. So, you know, and, and because of the constraints of the budgets and, and, and time that I usually work with, it's usually, usually it's a combination of the two uh, that works. You know, you, you know, when to go to, to limited animation and when to go to full animation. Yeah. And uh, on the Gibby cartoon that I'm working on, there was one point where um, I had a character who's, you know, he's he's uh, he's mm -hmm. fishing. And so he's like swinging the, the reel around like that. And he, and he does uh -huh. that. And it took me almost a day, maybe a day and a half to get that done. Oh, wow. You know, just yeah. that. But a, a couple of dialogue shots were, you know, like just me talking or maybe, you know, talking with my hands a little bit. Uh, I can get through like three or four of those in a day, uh, maybe even five or six, depending, as opposed to full animation. It might take me a day to get a whole yeah. shot like that done. It's a lot of work. So that, that's kind it. of the difference. Between, yeah. You know, what, what we often call limited animation, some prefer the term stylized. Right. You know, it sounds a little nicer versus right. full animation. Very cool. So I know you work with both animation and puppets. You have a preference on which one you like more? Um, not really. I, I think it kind of keeps me, uh, fresh and invigorated <laughs> kind of going between sure. the two. I might get, I might get a little, uh, you know, frustrated with how long animation's taking, you know, on, on some shots are like, ah, I gotta build a puppet. Nah, it's faster. <laughs> no. So I'll do that for a couple of days, but no, it is, it is kind of nice. And, um, uh, and, and of course, you know, also dabble in, in stop motion animation. I took a, mm -hmm. a class, uh, when I was going to SCAD in grad school, I went to SCAD for a couple of years. Uh, and my favorite class there was obviously the stop motion animation class because, of course, a big fan of, you know, Nightmare Before Christmas oh, yeah. and Coraline and films like that are just just uh, marvelous films. And so I'm, at, I'm with this this new preview that I'm doing for the book that I showed you the, uh, the storyboards mm -hmm. for. I'm actually going to be mixing uh, stop motion and uh, hand-drawn animation. Oh, very cool. Uh, but yeah, no, I don't think I want to do any puppetry in it. That's about the only thing. And there is, I don't, I don't want to give away the ending of the book, but there, there is a, I, I managed to work them sort of all together. Oh, cool. Uh, but yeah, I like, I like puppetry as well. Yeah. It's been, you know, doing, I've done that longer. I'm just a huge fan of Jim. Henry. And I know you have a puppet with you, right? Did you bring one? I've got more I'll than one. I'll, I'll start off with this one. I'm just so handy that you mentioned <laughs> that. Uh, 
but uh, yeah, I'll, I'll bring this one on. There's a couple of different kinds of puppets, of course. I mean, I'm I'm more of a fan of the you know the Sesame Street uh, uh, and uh, Muppet Show style Muppets, and even within them, they've got a couple of different ones. And this is the this is what you call a live arm puppet oh, here, cool. you see, because uh, I've actually got a uh, hand that I can use. <laughs> so, you see, you can kind of, this one's kind of like you can do that too. I mean, this is very low tech, but. How long did it take you to build <laughs> this guy? Oh, let's see. Uh, I think, let me think. Uh, two or three days. Yeah, that's what they usually take. Yeah. That is awesome. I love it. And is, does he have a name? About my t shirt, <laughs> ask me, ask me about I my love what is the t shirt you're wearing? I love that shirt, it's a great color. I am so glad you asked. <laughs> yeah, this says, uh, says a bad day squatching is still better than a good day at the office. I, I agree, <laughs> I, I couldn't agree more with that statement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, so this is, I'm actually going to be having him in a um. Uh, a commercial that I wrote uh, for the the T-shirts. Uh, and in fact, it's kind of funny because that the T-shirt he's wearing, I'm practically dramatizing that as a 30 second commercial where there's like a, there will be like a guy standing there looking with his binoculars. And then he comes up and tries to talk to him. And of course the guy doesn't even realize it's a Sasquatch talking to him. That's supposedly he's looking for a Sasquatch. He's right there talking to him. That'll be fun. Yeah. And, he, and there he is talking to him. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's going to, it's going to be fun. I think it's one of my, uh, uh, you know, my wife was uh, talking about this and I'm like, she says, you're going to make it complicated. Are you? I'm like, this is about as simple as it gets. So uh, that's, yeah, that's what I'm doing. It's, and of course it's on my cartooneville.com website. There's a link to both the book and the, um, you know, the t-shirts. So I'm doing, uh, I've got at least one t-shirt design for the, uh, that's promoting the book. Uh, and then I got several that are uh, cryptid related. I don't know how much you can see of that, but I'll, you know, uh, one of the things that we're um, one of the segments of the Cartooneville show is actually called uh, Doctor Thylacine's Hall of Cryptids. He is another one of the characters, and that's actually I'm glad that I mentioned him because he's of the other variety of puppet, which is uh, you know as I said, there's sort of two different uh, styles of of puppet for the most part, where you've got the uh, the live arm. Or, or almost like glove hand puppets, like say Fozzie Bear, you know, because he's he can actually move his hands like the the Sasquatch that I just did. And then the other was the uh, the rod arm puppets, and that's like you know Doctor Thylacine here because you know he's actually got a um, a rod working that you know much like Kermit right. the Frog. Yes, yes. So we've got a lot of oh, fix my glasses, would you? There's a good fellow. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> A little better. Hmm. I love that. Yes, Dr. Thylacine's Hall of Cryptids. Uh, what is it? Oh, uh, yeah, hallofcryptids.com. Yes, that's the <laughs> one. Yes. That's a, another of our many websites that we maintain here through cartooneville.com and the good graces of our host, uh, or, or your guest in this case, uh, Professor Mark. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, you must have fun all the time doing this. Oh, yes, yes. We can hardly shut him up. <laughs> Yeah, so he's um, yeah he's he's one of the ones I, I usually go to, went to more a lot more trouble on his uh, costume. Now his his costume is actually oh, handmade, cool. um, which uh, which took a lot of time. I try not to you know that's the cool thing about working with cartoon animals is you know nobody cares if they're wearing clothes or not. So that's a great thing because that is one of the things that that takes up so much time. Um, but in his case, it was you know there's just nowhere else I was going to find it. I had to. I got a pattern for his little vest, you see, and uh, and and the shirt. Of course, I had to modify them because they don't, you know, he likes to eat. <laughs> Who doesn't? <laughs> but, Especially in COVID. Apparently. <laughs> well, with that, if you don't mind me, I'll be over there. <laughs> so yeah, but uh, yeah, the what a, the one thing that's that's really saved me a lot of trouble uh, recently is working on the. Uh, I'll show you. I wasn't really planning to show you, but I'll go and show you this guy too because he—he's a case of that. What I started doing is working on the scale of uh, Build a Bear because they have some fantastic costumes <laughs> already for Build a Bear. Let me see if I can get him in here because he's got the, oh, cool. you know, because he's going to be, uh, 
looking, you know, he's going to be searching for Sasquatch. So I just went ahead and attached those to his oh, nose. Oh, okay. You know, so yeah, originally you can't really see much. He was originally, he started off as a, as a Bill Murray caricature and, uh, but he's just so far off. I don't think I have to worry about Bill Murray suing me. Uh, I hope. Yeah. I hope not. If anything, I feel like yeah, Bill Murray would enjoy it. <laughs> oh, I would think so. He seems to have a really good sense of humor. Yeah. Now, here's one. Now, this is these. This is where they start to get a little tricky because uh, some of them, you know, with a with a puppet um, that has never existed before in any other form, it's okay because I mean you can get away with if they don't look like anything they've seen. Because if you look at some of the original sketches of, of Jim Henson's mm -hmm. doodles, say Animal or Uncle Deadly, they don't look a whole lot like what they ended right. up being. Uh, but that was okay because nobody ever saw them. Right. But now uh, some characters that have existed in, say, for instance, 2D, mm -hmm. uh, you gotta, you're sort of obligated to try to make them look. So this this guy, it's a sort of a villain that I'm I doing. Like his mustache. Yeah, I thought you might. <laughs> <laughs> He's also a uh, live action uh, or live arm, I should say, uh, character. Almost finished. Uh, where's my lab coat? You said there was going to be a lab coat. <laughs> So he started as a 2D character that you have then. He did, yeah. He was actually, uh, yeah, this is Dr. Gray. He's from uh, the Mocha Girls Project, which is, that was another one that we did a, a 2D, I think he needs some mustache moves. <laughs> I'll send some over. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, I love the stash, bud. <laughs> so, um, yeah, he's... Uh, that's from the uh, the Mocha Girls project, which is uh, that's another client, and that's sort of what sort of got into this whole Cartooniville Funhouse um, show that I'm putting together. Is I, I tried, you know, it's, it's one of the things about self publishing is I've, I've done. There's two different. There's really two different ways of, of getting a book published. There's the traditional way, which uh, you know you you write a query letter and you know try to try to get a, a publisher interested in it. And uh, then the parade of rejections begins, you know, usually six months before they say, yeah, it's not for us. Mm -hmm. No, thank you. Yeah. Next. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, the payoff is better because, you know, they, they cover all the costs of printing and they handle publicity right. and marketing and all of that stuff. Uh, Self-publishing or is what it was once called is now, you know, non-traditional mm -hmm. publishing where you pay for the publishing cost. And, um, you know, but the, uh, which, it's great because you still get editorial services, which I want. You know, I want somebody proofreading my work, even though I proofread like crazy. Um, but I, I really do like a second pair of eyes. Uh, but the only thing, and, and they can get you listed on like Barnes and Noble and, and Amazon and, and so on, which is great because I wouldn't know how to do any of that. But really, the only downside is they they don't do a lot for you as far as publicity, and that's that's what I've that's where uh, I've got to you know, uh, kick in the shameless art of, of self publicity because nobody else Absolutely. is going to do it. Um, so what I did is I made a short film. I started off, I made like a short little, uh, ended up being a three minute film that I entered in some film festivals and, you know, won uh, some, you know, like best trailer or something Very like cool. that. Uh, I think it was LA independent shorts mm -hmm. festival, something like that. I can't remember the exact title of the, I, I can you know try to get that to you. But um, and now I'm working on another one, which is like stop motion and animation. But one of the, the, the things that came up to the idea for this cartoony little funhouse show is um, one of my clients, uh, Bryant from world of blinky and friends dot com or blinky kids club dot com. He's got, I think he's got two different websites. Um, he said he wanted to do this bit where he had me build one of his puppets, which I don't have blinky anymore. He's he's got right. that one. I, I gave that to him. He's going to be shooting them on blue screen because Blinky's ah, green. Yeah, that so won't work. Be, <laughs> yeah, that wouldn't work. It'd be like Kermit the Frog in a green screen. They're like two <laughs> ping pong balls. Uh, so Blinky would be about, you know, he'd be in the same boat. But um, now he had this, what I thought was a terrific idea, uh, where he said he was going to have Blinky being interviewed by a reporter about the show. I thought, now that's interesting. Instead of just an author talking about the work, have your characters talking about the work, which all, to me is just immediately more interesting. You know, ta a character talking about the story that they're they're taking place in, almost like that episode of The Muppet Show where the Star Wars characters right. uh, pop. One of my favorite episodes, easily. But, uh, so that's that's what we're doing. We're, uh, I thought, oh, let's, let's build a whole show around that, because I tried, 
contacting like the local papers, uh, who I won't name <laughs> <laughs> in the area. Um, and I didn't get a single response from any of them. I guess like, well, you know, maybe there's just so many authors and illustrators or authors slash illustrators living around. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's just not really of interest to them. I thought, well, man, I just, I can't even get invited. So, so I was like, well, dang it. If they're not going to invite me on their talk shows, I'll make my own. So uh, we had done a, 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 with Dr. Thylacine last year, we did the uh, Dr. Thylacine's uh, Halloween of Cryptids. Uh, which was a TV special that we did for AIB Network uh, here in Atlanta. And uh, I, I told them about the idea, and they loved it. Thank goodness. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so they were they were really supportive, uh, which I really appreciated. And, and so we're putting the show together. It'll be uh, hopefully soon, you know, broadcasting. I just I don't want to mention a date yet because that's, that's one of the problems when you're a one-man show. <laughs> Well, that's again. That's not fair to say the one man show because I still got got you know John Bonet again doing some wonderful. He's got some marvelous backgrounds for you. Know, I might you know share those with you shortly. Um, and uh, you know Jen Lee's uh, she's already doing some of the voices, and I've got uh, uh, this this new uh, stop motion animation crossover that I'm doing uh, this this new uh, spot. That'll also be that's that's planned for the show. Uh, so I get that's the idea there is just, you know, a bunch of independence. You know, if if the big boys won't do anything to support us, then dang it. The let's us is in, the independent artists and creators. Let's get together. Let's support each other. You know, let's make this happen. Absolutely. Well, it sounds like you've got a lot of exciting stuff going on. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah it's, yeah, it's fun. It's fun. It's a lot of work, but it's fun. Yeah. yeah. So if people watching this want to either see your work or buy a book or get in touch with you to hire you for animation, how can, what's the best way to do that? The best way to do that is cartooniville.com. My, uh, you know, contact information's, uh, is there. Uh, that's also, there's a link to the, the book. I, my, my, uh, the, the publisher, it's direct. It's, I mean, you can get the book on Amazon. You can get it on, um, uh, it's on Amazon. It's on Barnes and Noble. Um, I think Ingram Spark is that the other one? I think I think it's on there too. But anyway, you can you can get all of those to the the publisher is listed there on uh, cartooniville dot com. Uh, my uh, I mean you know if you like we can share my Facebook information on on the Absolutely. screen too. Um, but yeah, those are really that, those are good for updates and you know little uh, sneak peeks of what I'm working on. And uh, but cartooniville.com, that's sort of the go to. And even even with cartooniville.com, that'll still take you to my, my Facebook page. Perfect. For, you know, day to day updates on these little wacky little projects with me and my wacky pals, you know. Well, Professor Mark, I appreciate your time and, and letting us dive into your world. And, and I am excited to uh, to see what happens. Well, thank you. I so much appreciate you, Nick. I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to me and uh Patience and listening to all these uh, wacky behind the scenes stuff of of animation and puppetry and stop motion animation. Perfect. Well, sir, thank you so much. Thank you, Nick. (laughs) There now. What seems to be the trouble, guys? Well, fellas. Last night, Sasquatch, Debbie, and Thurman and me were sitting right here when there was a blinding flash of light. And the next thing we knew, he was in this artist studio. And more cartoon characters kept popping out of his sketchbook. Like Space World, Monsters. And then, there was this here really pretty bat lady named Jail. But it turned out to be this crazy platypus critter named Dagger Bill. Well, welcome home, Professor. <laughs> the Struggling Cartoonist, an illustrated adventure story available online through cartooniville.com.